Good evening. Thank you all for uh, having us here uh, in your lovely community. My name is Jay Williams. I have the privilege and the opportunity of serving uh, as the president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. It has been uh, just over a year uh, that my family and I have relocated here to the greater Hartford region and are uh, very much enjoying and it's been an eventful year both in terms of personally and professionally uh, and excited to be here with you this evening. Uh, the reason that we are here this evening, uh, as you have responded to uh, our invitation and graciously uh, allowed uh, us to share some of your time, is that we are in the midst of a 29-town listening tour. And we like to call these our tour stops. We're not a band. We don't have roadies or groupies. But uh, nevertheless, this is a 29-town tour, of which this is the 13th or 14th tour stop uh, this is the, let me see how many towns we've done. This is our 19th town out of 29. Uh, when we uh, had our Greater Together celebration of giving uh, of our donors and, 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 and participants and stakeholders last year, we made a public commitment that we were going to start doing things differently, that we were going to lean in and be proximate to the challenges, the opportunities, uh, and there was no better way to get a sense of what's going on in our communities than to hear from those stakeholders firsthand uh, not inviting them down to the Hartford Foundation offices, uh, but instead asking to come to their communities, to come and hear uh, and do more listening than talking than we've ever done before, uh, to hear the frustrations, the aspirations, uh, the things that we can do to be a better, more valuable partner to you. So we're excited about that. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping issues I'd like to point out. Uh, first of all, recognizing that the town of Glastonbury is celebrating its 325th anniversary this year. So uh, congratulations uh, and happy to be uh, a part of that uh, discussion in this community. Uh, we, the foundation, have a lot of connections to Glastonbury. We have uh, our former board chair uh, and former interim president of the foundation, Yvette Melendez. I don't know if Yvette's here yet. There she is, uh, Yvette Melendez and her husband Chad are here, so residents of Glastonbury. Uh, one of our current board members, Andrew Worthington. Where's Andrew? Andrew's not here yet. So Andrew Worthington uh, it grew up in Glastonbury. We have uh, our senior vice president of community investments, Judy Rossi Battle. Judy, I know is here. I was just talking to her. I told you I was going to call you out, Judy. Uh, is a resident of Glastonbury. So uh, again, lots of connections to, to Glastonbury. We are also, uh, hopefully you've made use of the refreshments that are catered by the David Allen Hospitality Group. Uh, please, I still see a lot of stuff back there, uh, so by all means, please uh, consume those, uh, and it's just a small token of appreciation for sharing your time with us. Uh, we have photography going on uh, by Defining Studios. Christine is going to be helping to capture uh, the dynamic discussion here. Um, we also have Costanza from Veil vale Veil vale Designs, who is gracing us with her exceptional talents and will be live doodling, capturing the discussion and the energy uh, that we have here this evening. Special thanks to Bobby DeBella, who is, where's Bobby? Who has been our official greeter uh, for this evening. Uh, if you, I'm sure everyone or virtually everyone here knows Bobby. So Bobby, thank you for greeting us and welcoming us here uh, to this beautiful facility. Uh, and we are also capturing this on camera and via a live stream. So when you stand up to ask your question or give your comment, if you would wait momentarily until the microphone arrives. So uh, even if you can project and we hear you in the room, uh, it's important that we be able to capture this uh, for our live stream audience and also for uh, the video recording that's going on. So uh, please, CTN uh, is doing our live streaming and, and working together with this staff. So that being the case, I want to start off by showing uh, a brief video just to give a little bit of background and, and set some context uh, and then I'll come back and we'll engage uh, in, a, in a discussion. When, when I say discussion, really we are here uh, to listen, to hear from you. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, but Ryan, if you would mind running the video. So, you want to leave a legacy? Why not send me to college? Help me be a better provider or help support local programs. At the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, through your generosity, we make both big and small dreams come true. This isn't just a donation, this is an investment. Through our careful financial stewardship, your money will last forever, helping numerous nonprofit organizations in the 29-town greater Hartford area, changing countless lives along the way. It's a tradition that goes back to 1925, 
The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving is one of the oldest and largest community foundations in the country. We help donors impact the issues they care about, such as education, health, the arts, economic and community development, early childhood, and more. This is your community, and it's our community too. More than 90 years of experience means we understand the big picture, how different issues connect, and what will be needed in the future. The Hartford Foundation is invested in the vibrancy of every town in Greater Hartford. We award grants, share knowledge and data, influence public policy, host events, and build partnerships. But most importantly, we help people like you make a difference. Whether you want to establish a scholarship, join a giving circle, or start your own donor-advised fund, we are here to help. We'll make sure you reach your philanthropic goals, whatever they may be. The gift you give today will make an impact now and for years to come. It's about making Greater Hartford a better place, and you can make a difference. We promise. So, what will your legacy be? The Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Together for good. So the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, as was mentioned in the video, is the largest community foundation in the state of Connecticut, one of the largest community foundations in the entire country. And we are the community foundation for the 29-town Greater Hartford region. And while simultaneously being that regional community foundation, we are the community foundation for Glastonbury. Uh, as I said uh, in the, a few minutes ago, that uh, we don't take for granted the fact that we've been here uh, for almost 93 years, for over 93 years. Uh, and our existence is directly reflected uh, of the generosity of people from across the town, from Glastonbury, from the other 28 towns, who have been generous uh, in, in blessing us with their uh, philanthropic interest and in, in sharing with us their resources and entrusting us to be a steward of those resources to turn around and invest in the things that help to improve the quality of life uh, in the entire region. And we don't take for granted uh, the responsibility that we have. And in doing that, uh, we understand that over the course of those 93 years, things have changed. The landscape has changed across the state of Connecticut. It's changed across the Greater Hartford region. It's changed here in Glastonbury. And while we have a number of invaluable nonprofit partners and stakeholders and donors uh, who are constantly uh, engaging us and talking to us and sharing with us their thoughts and ideas, we don't take for granted uh, that we always have our finger on the pulse of everything to the extent we should. That takes effort, active listening, active engaging. And that's why we committed, uh, with the support of the board, to do this 29-town listening tour last year. And initially, we thought, we'll do this. There's 29 towns. There's a lot going on. So we'll do this over the course, uh, perhaps, of a couple years. And then we took a step back, and we really challenged ourselves and, and appreciate the staff and the discussion and said, well, you know what? A couple years is not, is not a terribly long time. Uh, but why can't or shouldn't we do this uh, to the extent we can within a year? So it was earlier, we made the commitment in November of last year, and it was in January, February of this year that we started. And we are now uh, 19 towns in of the 29. Just because of the uh, conspiring of the calendar and logistics, we are just going to be a handful of towns short uh, of getting all 29 towns in this calendar year. So the five or six towns that we have left to engage, uh, we are going to do that early in 2019. And the other part of this is because we want this to be substantive engagement. This isn't a one and done, we check the box and say, oh, we hit the towns, pat ourselves on the back and, and go on about our business. The discussions, the feedback that we are getting from all of you is going to be invaluable in helping us to shape our strategic plan that is underway now and our work going forward in the future. So I've already said a lot, and this is not an I, uh, and a venue for us to do uh, the talking. It's for us to do the listening. So uh, we are here to hear from you. Uh, what are your thoughts and your aspirations? What do you love about Glastonbury? What are some of the frustrations that you have uh, within the, the, the town or within the region? Uh, how can we be a more valuable partner? How can we help to advance the interests of the town and the concerns of the town? whether they're specific to the town or whether they're specific or they relate to the town's place in the greater Hartford region. That's why we're here. I'm here with uh, a very talented and dedicated uh, a portion of our talented and dedicated staff. So we're, you have multiple pairs of ears listening and, and we're recording this and writing this down uh, and going to demonstrate how what we glean from our discussion, which is just the beginning of an ongoing discussion with all of our towns, how that's going to really shape and inform. So, Again, looking to hear from you. Those are a couple of leading questions 
Uh, a standard line I have is that uh, me and us doing the talking isn't how these things work well. It's really hearing from you. So this is a group that looks to me to be a, a, a group that is uh, eager to engage. I know we had lots of discussion and mingling just a few minutes ago before we got started, and we want to have that happen in our discussions now. Uh, so please volunteer yourself. And if you don't, I always say, uh, if you don't raise your hand or volunteer, but you make eye contact, I'll take that as a sign that you want to say something. <laughs> So that means you either have to raise your hand or look away from me because one of the two are, are going to be the initial sign that we, we really value your discussion. So that be the case if, again, you would stand up uh, your name and if you uh, have an affiliation with uh, or a particular interest or, or with a nonprofit or a donor, just please share that with us also. And questions or comments because this is about hearing from you uh, around those areas of how we can be a better partner. What are the things that you aspire to as residents? What are the things that frustrate you? How uh, can we be of assistance? So, open up the floor. No hands, but I see lots of eyes. Okay, all right. <laughs> there you go. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Emily Daigle. Um, I have been a taxpayer and homeowner in Glastonbury for 15 years now. And I'm a New Hampshire transplant. I did not grow up here. Um, and Connecticut, I'm still learning to call home, but Glastonbury I do call home. I love this town. I have two small children um, that I'm raising in this community with my husband. We are so grateful for the educational opportunities that we have here, um, and we really love being here, but I think that we have the capacity and resources in our town to do better. Um, I have a laundry list, but I'm only gonna focus on one thing tonight. Uh, my friend Allison's here with me, and as moms, as uh, people that believe very firmly that we all have a responsibility to be stewards of the environment, uh, we have slowly started gathering very informal data about the businesses in our town that recycle and don't recycle. And unfortunately, the news is not positive, uh, has been our experience. Uh, it's actually been no every time we've asked. And I feel like I'm a teenager back in the 90s again, and we're like having this new conversation about recycling with people, and it's feeling very antiquated and redundant. And I feel like we need to do better to be stewards of the earth. We have an agricultural town. It's our roots in this town. And we have a responsibility, uh, completely you know, nonpartisan responsibility to the next generation to be leaders with this. So my hope, and we are willing and excited to participate in this effort, is to see what we can do, how we can do it better um, without reinventing the wheel, seeing what other communities are doing in response to this need, and really working as a community to just do better and continue to make this a better place to live for everybody. So that's our focus. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Oh, not take off. <laughs> so my, um, my staff always admonishes me to keep my comments brief. I have a tendency, I, I just really love and enjoy, but I, I have to just add this, that that issue is, is of particular interest. It's an issue that's just near and dear to my heart. And my wife isn't here this evening, but she would probably roll her eyes when I tell the story that uh, we were on vacation uh, a couple years ago, and I'm a big advocate of recycling. And for whatever reason, where we were staying in the airport, they didn't have recycling. So I was running and working out and I had this, this backpack full of Gatorade bottles that I just refused to throw away. You know, they were calling us to board the plane. I'm like w running around the airport trying to find some place to recycle and I couldn't. And she's looking at me like, you're just absolutely nuts. And it still kills me to this day that I couldn't find a place to recycle them. So throwing away like a half dozen plastic bottles when it just didn't, it made no sense to have to do that. And it's been one of those issues that we've seen in communities, some things that we take for granted uh, it's, it's, you know, mainstream and fairly easy to do, but to, to get that as a part of the community, uh, whether it's curbside recycling or the businesses, is certainly something, uh, you know, that we would welcome an opportunity to uh, engage and, and figure out how that would best uh, be uh, approached in this community. So thank you very much for sharing that. So our, uh, come to our guest over here. Yep. And in the meantime, our Andrew uh, Worthington, I introduced you, Andrew, just a few minutes ago as having grown up here in Glastonbury. So our board member, Andrew Worthington, has joined us. So thank you for joining us, Andrew. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Um, playing, and I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but um, I am with a group, an environmental group here in Glastonbury. We'd love to have you. Um, it's called TALK, which stands for Truth in Action and Love and Kindness. And I'm in the environmental group in that um, larger group. And one of the things that we are focusing now on, um, and we had previously worked on 
on banning fracking waste into the city of Glastonbury. And that was passed by our town council. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckett, uh, last year. And I guess it was this year, just way back in the beginning of the year. Um, but now we want to start encouraging people and ultimately businesses to, to discontinue using single-use plastic. Um, that includes bags, straws, lids, all of the things that um, we don't really need and we can use other items to replace those. And I looked at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving because they have the specific um, Sistero Fund for Glastonbury and am hoping that there is some way that we can work out um, purchasing um, reusable um, shopping bags to give to elderly and low-income persons who can't afford to buy the bags themselves so that they can refuse the plastic when they go shopping. And, um, but yes, I think the environmental issues are huge. When I was at the PTO way back when, um, we started recycling in the schools. It's still not perfect um, because we have the blue bins there, but it doesn't always happen. And I think there just needs to be more education, which is one of the focuses of our group, is educating people about ways to learn to avoid the plastic. Thank you. Another benefit that we see in our listening sessions is just what we saw here is people being connected around similar interests who may not have otherwise crossed paths. So thank you. Yep. Yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm Ira Yellen. Um, I have to say I'm on the Catalyst Steering Committee, so we're always looking for members, right? Former chair, did I do it well? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm also a transplant 22 years from, well, been after a bunch of years, um, but from New York originally. Um, and my wife and I moved 22 years ago from over from Wethersfield over to Glastonbury. We're on Tall Timbers Road. And um, we moved in there. It was pretty much homogeneous, people above 50. I look at our neighborhood today. We got young couples in their 20s and people in their 80s. And I think the connection is not there. Other than if we walk our dogs, we get to know people. Right. And uh, I think we need to think about the intergenerational thing. I think that by nature, people kind of go to the, their groups. Mm -hmm. So you got school groups and you got this group. And I think the problems we arise is when we silo and kind of identify with a group versus, of course, it's prevalent today in our society. And being former Charity Education Foundation here, our initial start was getting a whole cross section of different people to sit on the board and be involved, represent businesses and so forth. And being a small business person and being involved in the community, I see this as going to be a, a problem. So what we do and our, what we do is to invite our neighbors in. And I'm only, I figure I've been there 22 years and I've been in, in our neighborhood maybe six houses. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm not friendly, it's just that people go and live their lives right. and realizing you don't know who even you're next to and what exactly they're doing. And knowing the foundation, who is very much into intergenerational stuff, I'd suggest somehow setting some programs together, or some guidelines, so we don't end up siling ourselves any more than necessary. Thank Thanks, you Jay. for the comments. And, and again, we uh, ask that you see us as a resource to help facilitate uh, the connections between people, because communities, as we all know, are more than houses and lawns and schools and facilities. It's really about the people, and more importantly, the relationship that exists between those people. Uh, those residents, those stakeholders. And we've heard that uh, in a number of our other communities about the need to have intergenerational connections. Sometimes it comes up uh, in the uh, form of a, a, a community center or a senior center uh, that would facilitate having uh, our seniors connect with uh, individuals who are of a much younger generation and all the benefits uh, that can be derived out of that. So we uh, also see ourselves as a convener. That's one of the powerful tools that we have uh, is our ability to convene around an issue that is of an interest or priority to the community. So again, we welcome those conversations about how we could help facilitate, facilitate that here in the town of Glastonbury. There was a hand over here. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is uh, George Norman. I've been a resident here for 16 years. I'm actually on the town council. Hopefully a couple of you know that at least. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, my comment actually, though, is uh, a little bit beyond, you know, Glastonbury and thinking you know, of more, you know, really Connecticut and, and the greater Hartford area is, uh, and I think one area of interest to me, I'll call it vocational education, it may not be the best term, and, and frankly, so I was in the Navy, I've moved around, we actually have, in my estimation, pretty good vocational education relative to the rest of the country here. But I think there's more we could do as we think about what is Connecticut, what's our future as a state, where can we play? You know, it is that kind of combination of intellectual and financial capital between Boston and New York. We've got to figure out for our own uh, economics as well as the people who live here, you know, how can we really make that, I think, something that can be uh, you know, win win as the, as the saying goes. And that would be an area I'd be interested in. So uh, you are uh, talking about an issue that is one of the emerging areas, focus areas of our strategic plan, which is, as I indicated, something that we're working on getting feedback and input from a wide array of stakeholders. That notion of how to best position this region in a global economy. And you pointed out, and, and I appreciate you pointing it out specifically as an elected official, uh, because it is it, it's sometimes easy to take a, a, a very myopic view uh, and when you're elected by residents of Glastonbury or whatever respective town those elected officials, you have an obligation and expectation to serve those interests. Uh, and there are so many interests, it's easy to do that and say, well, you know, that other bigger picture regional stuff will, will somehow take care of itself, but it won't. Not unless we have individuals who are demonstrating that type of thinking. And it, it doesn't have to be either or, because as an improvement to Connecticut or an improvement to the greater Hartford region is by definition an improvement to Glastonbury. Uh, and when you talk about the, the notion of those vocational skills that is a part of a larger national conversation that we got away from uh, as a country, you know, uh, too many years ago and, and, and said that, you know, the notion of having a skill that in a career that doesn't necessarily need a, a PhD or an MBA or, or four year degree, all those things are important. And we want students and individuals to aspire to those things. But what we don't want to do is devalue or diminish or somehow say this is a second class career if you choose to enter into a vocation where you're using your hands and you're using uh, your creativity, especially in today's economy, because we have seen, and, and that was an area of focus of mine uh, when I was in the Obama administration, is how we can support uh, both from a policy standpoint, from an investment standpoint, but also capturing the hearts and minds of young people, uh, people who are underemployed and their parents that these aren't secondary things, that if you can't or aren't gonna go work on Wall Street or Silicon Valley or be a physician or something of that nature, that, oh, well, you know, let's see, let's see what else we can do. These are careers to aspire to. In this region, we've got world-class employers, whether it's Electric Boat or Pratt & Whitney or, or so many of the others, uh, who are saying that there is a dearth of pipeline, in the pipeline of individuals who have these skills that don't require a four-year degree, that these companies are willing to invest in uh, as long as they walk in the door with a basic set of knowledge and understanding that they're willing to invest in and they can't find them. Uh, and that's not just present here, that's present across the country. And these are careers. These aren't just jobs. These are careers that provide opportunities for advancement, that provide great pay and great benefits, that provide longevity. So uh, I appreciate you pointing that out. And it is especially important as we find ourselves between Boston and New York and I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. So Youngstown, Ohio is between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, Chicago, New York. So I, I understand that sort of middle community syndrome. You know, you, you got the big boys over here and you're sort of fighting and trying to find that identity. Uh, and we, when we finally recognize, you know, Cleveland is great and Pittsburgh is great, but Youngstown and Mahoney Valley offers something special. The same thing about Connecticut. And, and it isn't in a secondary or an inferior standpoint. Uh, in fact, it's a strength that if we recognize, and, and, and we've got to make tough decisions, and, and there are really uh, real hurdles and challenges that we have to face, but that type of thinking, and especially having it come from an elected official and, and those who uh, support you uh, in that, uh, you and others, uh, again, something that we would very much welcome because a part of our strategic plan is how do we uh, make strategic investments, uh, use the stewardship of the resources in that area to help bolster the economy. And, uh, we are getting more and more involved as a foundation in uh, economic and community development in ways that are much different than we have in the past because when you look at the landscape, you know, these are opportunities that if we miss, it's going to be a very difficult notion to try to figure out how to make us competitive, uh, you know, in an increasingly globalized economy. So thank you for that very much. And we would welcome some ongoing conversation 
uh, if you would be willing with us about that and, and, and ideas that we might pursue. Yes, by all means. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Chitranjan Sahai. I'm a professor of manufacturing engineering at the University of Hartford and also serve on the Board of Education here. Uh, I moved to Glastonbury in 99, so I've been here for about 19 years or so. Um, what I always hear from all the public officials, you know, that we have a big pool of talent, talented workforce here. Mm -hmm. But I don't know where the, that talent force is. We, we are in an area which is really a space science area, the, the rocket sciences here. I find that there's, there, there's a lack of talent, and unless we are able to, to do something to get them updated, to get the workforce development, including all the vocational training that you were talking about, we are in deep trouble. I work with uh, Pratt & Whitney, I work with the electric board as consultant and trying to do some workforce development for them. And I see that uh, there is really none. The, the thing that we take pride of is not there. You know, it's just, we are just saying that, but we really, really we need a lot of infusion right. into the workforce. Uh, talent so that they can stay competitive. This is the area where we are talking rocket sciences. You know? If this, if Bradley doesn't do rocket science, who else does it? You know, if if EV doesn't do that, who else does it? We have we have we have that talent here. Secondly, coming back to a vocational training, the the society is like a body. We need mind. We also need feet. We also need stomach. So we have to have all part. None none of them is not valuable. We, 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 leg is not inferior to mind in any way because that's where we stand on. So we need all kinds of people, all sections of education. And to that effect, the Glastonbury uh, uh, high school system, our school system has developed a center for robotics engineering technology. What are we doing to support that? You know, we need the support for that kind of thing. Right. We need kind, that kind of support to basically the, the school in Hartford, Hartford system and elsewhere so that we can prepare people for real jobs. These jobs are not small jobs. They are right. not underemployed. I think some of them get, them get paid better than many engineers and, and, and many other things. So salary-wise, it's just a question of what kind of work you do. If you like that, that's what it is. One has to follow hard, not necessarily always the money, you know. So if, if you, are, you, you want money, I think there's plenty of money working as plumbers, technicians, electricians, or wherever you have. And we certainly need them. There's no question in my mind, you know. I'm a professor, I'm a PhD in engineering, but I know that they complement us. They, we cannot live without, without, without the electricians, technician, technicians, and all kinds of people. So I would, I would like to suggest us to find out ways in which to support that kind of technical education and where the future jobs are. If we don't prepare our students or the young people, our own children for that one, who else will do it? Right. We, have to get, we have got to do that, you know, and we have to think a little bigger to not only for the current inco incumbent workforce, but also for the younger children that are looking up for a job in 5, 10, 20 years. Absolutely. 10, 10 years. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for sharing that and, and just reaffirming that, that notion uh, that this is when we talk about education education is a significant priority area of the foundation has been for uh, a number of years and continues to be in this new evolving strategic plan uh, but understanding when we're saying education that is inclusive of our traditional thought of K through 12 and then post-secondary education but those vocational the technical education that you talked about yeah. and understanding like you're saying that it isn't uh, too early to start at in the elementary schools because capturing the imagination and capturing the hearts and minds of those students and their parents uh, is essentially important and while we've been talking about uh, electric boat and pratt and whitney that doesn't even speak of the the suppliers the small uh, businesses that really is where the majority of the jobs in this country continue to be produced 75 percent of the jobs produced in this country are produced by small businesses so while the the, the world-class companies continue to be an essential part of, of this uh, economy in this region and in this state, let's not underestimate or overlook the demand that is uh, driven by small businesses and those who ultimately uh, decide to be entrepreneurs. So they're all tied together, helping to facilitate that entrepreneurial thinking, that entrepreneurial economy, uh, specifically as it relates to those technical skills. Uh, and, and you're right, the pay, the benefits, the longevity uh, of these jobs are uh, resilient and continue to increase. So thank you for, for reaffirming that.
Okay. okay, I know someone had a stopwatch, <laughs> wondering how long is it going to be before Yvette gets up and says no, something. I was going to call. I was going to give you a few more minutes. At that point, I was just going to put you on the spot. But I want to stay with this theme um, because there's one key piece that I know we talk a lot about at the foundation, and that's the issue of collaboration, which. Um, we foster, it's endemic in the way we approach our grant making. And relative to the issue of uh, vocational training, we are fortunate, and I'm gonna wear like a bunch of different hats. Please do, you, you. Um, We are fortunate in Connecticut that we have a very rich public higher education system, 12 community colleges, four state universities, as well as UConn and a whole host of private universities as well. And for a state the size of Connecticut, to, for us to have as many, a presence in so many communities in terms of two-year programs um, near us, uh, we have for Glastonbury, many of our students go on to Manchester Community College where there's a manufacturing program. Uh, there's Esnuntuck, there's Tunxis, I mean, and it's really not that far. The question is how do we look at ways in which towns and communities can better co collaborate, not only with institutions of higher education, um, whether it's resources that come through the foundation for creative, innovative programming. I mean, we have an example of another institution, the Connecticut Public uh, Broadcasting System, that did something similar to try to encourage journalism among um, high school students, and they got involved working with Hartford High School students to create an academy to introduce students to another field. I know that's not manufacturing, but it is a career track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think sometimes we reinvent the wheel, and there really are lots, we have tremendous resources in our state, in this region, and the question is how can we better be creative about those collaborations with those organizations, nonprofit organizations that are doing job training, how do we introduce people outside of Glastonbury? You mentioned some of the treasures in Glastonbury. I mean, we have things, the Audubon Society, our agricultural, I mean, today you, you see these beautiful birds flying by, you know, how do you create programs that introduce kids, whether it's from Hartford, East Hartford, Manchester, and I know we do some of that already, but there really is an opportunity to look at our own institutions and how do you create better co collaborations, introduce people outside of Glastonbury to this community? Because like someone else said, I've been in this community for over um, 25 years and we often don't take the time to get to know right. everyone. It's usually because I'm spending all my time in Hartford. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think there is a lot of opportunity to create those collaborations by looking at the resources we have locally. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and it is essential, and it, it has to be intentional, because we can say you know, that most of us are well-intended and think that's a great idea. Uh, but at the same time, we can point to a whole host of things that we're busy doing and that are very important priorities. And that is also, that approach to innovative collaboration is something that we've taken to heart at the foundation uh, and have made a, an intentional effort to redouble our efforts to communicate, uh, to collaborate uh, with stakeholders. Uh, uh, one very small, but I, I hopefully more powerful and growing example is our collaboration with community foundations outside of our region. So the Hartford Co Foundation for Public Giving, uh, a, the Foundation for the Greater, the Greater New Haven Community Foundation down in New Haven, uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation, uh, and the Foundation for Eastern Connecticut. The four of us uh, are looking and, and meet on a regular basis, the CEOs and the staff, to talk about and act on ways that we can collaborate. And we've done a few things uh, that we've collaborated on an op-ed with respect to the state's fiscal condition and the impact that that's having on nonprofits. Uh, we are collaborating and investing our resources around increasing civic engagement throughout the state. Uh, we are talking about issues of statewide concern and policy. So while we are a regional community foundation, this is a small state. And if 
four, uh, those are just four of the larger community foundations, in addition to collaborating with other smaller community foundations throughout the state and other nonprofits. So you're absolutely right. Uh, and you know, one small victory, and for people outside of the community foundation, you're thinking like, well, that's, that's something you guys are victorious about. But we, we for the first time, uh, collaborated on a joint application where uh, we, in the area of journalism, uh, the Connecticut Mirror was doing a, a series on issues of statewide interest. So, you know, while it seems like a small thing, and it is a small thing, it was a huge, it was a huge victory in the foundation world where we uh, agreed on one application uh, for the Connecticut Mirror to be able to provide the information to all four of us. So we funded it, uh, all four separately, but from one application. And, you know, you would think like, gee whiz, I mean, you know, you guys are, but yeah, you know, that's how sometimes siloed we were, uh, that we see them as friendly, we don't see ourselves as competitors, but something as simple as that, you know, took however many, however uh, long that we've been in existence for us to come together. Uh, so that also then, as we look at ways to be more collaborative and innovative uh, with stakeholders and partners, uh, the same thing for the communities. And we've heard that, and I appreciate uh, of it raising that because we've heard that uh, universally throughout every one of the community discussions that we've had. Too often, and it is easy to divide ourselves by our town lines. One of the first things I learned when I, my family and I moved here, you know, 169 towns. That, that is a number that just, you know, is burned in your mind. Uh, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but where it does become a potential detriment is if we continue to define ourselves by those town borders or those zip codes, because uh, economic opportunity doesn't uh, define itself that way. When you talk about the environmental resources, those birds, that may be, you know, uh, you know, nesting here uh, in Glastonbury ultimately, you know, are impacted by the community, uh, all communities. The watershed uh, is runs the water course runs through the community, so we are connected and tied culturally, economically, uh, in ways uh, that really uh, make the level of collaboration and the commitment to collaboration essential. And there's nothing wrong with loving and being passionate about the treasures that exist, and you should in Glastonbury, the same for the residents of Farmington, the same for the residents of Art Hartford and East Hartford, uh, but if it becomes an us versus them in terms of the thinking, the approach, uh, this uh, state is too small, the region is too small, uh, and ultimately we will find ourselves uh, you know, living and operating beneath the resource levels and the potentials that we have. So it's not easy, uh, especially in this environment that we currently find ourselves in. There are uh, a whole bunch of areas that we can choose to be polarized around, uh, but at the end of the day, the, the success of this region, we are all intricately tied together. And to the extent that we can incentivize and leverage collaboration, uh, and, and to the extent we've got elected officials who are willing to stand up and do that and then be supported uh, by their constituents or vice versa, uh, it will be for the benefit of us all. So uh, any of those areas, we have tried to incentivize collaboration in our thinking and our grant making. Uh, we're going to be doing more and more of that. Uh, and to the extent that there are great ideas, out there from our donors, from our nonprofits, from our concerned stakeholders and citizens, we welcome that conversation. And it's something that uh, is not going to, uh, you know, it's a given, I, well, I'll tell you from our standpoint, it's a given that that is not only going to be uh, the mindset and the approach that we're gonna increasingly make that a focus uh, of our activities, that level of collaboration. So thank you, Yvette. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Ekman. I'm the Director of Education for the Connecticut Audubon Society. So thanks, Yvette, for the shout out. <laughs> um, I actually have two different points, sure. things I want to mention, if that's OK. Absolutely. Um, as far as the collaboration goes, um, just this morning I was meeting with the Vice President of Programs for the Connecticut Science Center. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of work together, but we've never uh, worked together in terms of our student outreach. Mm -hmm. and. We've had these conversations a lot. We reach the same students, the same school districts. You know, at the Kanka Audubon Society, we reach a lot of East Hartford students and Manchester students. Sadly, we reach almost none of the Glastonbury schools. Um, they stopped coming a number of years ago, and we hope to re-engage them at some point. Um, but, you know, the Connecticut Science Center has all these amazing programs. The Connecticut Audubon Society, we also have these amazing programs, and there's other a nonprofit that are doing something similar, but they're complementary. Yet we're not connecting them, and it's going to take some support um, from the people that support us to be able to say, "Hey, 
let's make opportunities for you to really sit down and, and make these experiences, um, like I have a story that weaves through the whole thing. Instead of having these disparate, unconnected experiences, our students would benefit so much from us all collaborating together. And then the next thing that I wanted to mention, um, your know, organization is based in Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that in our nonprofit, and this is really a, an issue in nonprofits in general, is we really lack diversity. Diversity in our boards, diversity in our staffs and our volunteers. And something that we desperately want to improve. However, we need support to do that. Um, and from my research, your foundation has the best resources in the state to be able to help nonprofits travel that road. Um, unfortunately, because of how we're situated, um, the majority of our constituents sit in a different county. And you just mentioned these really, I'm just so happy to know that you sit down and have conversations mm -hmm. with other community foundations. Um, and nonprofits like ours that may not be able to necessarily avail ourselves of the amazing resources you have, you know, maybe could there be some kind of collaborative programs that we can. So I just want to bring that up and thank you for your time. Thank you. And, and that's a perfect example because when we sit down, uh, when I'm sitting down with, you know, Juanita James in, in Fairfield County or Will Ginsburg or, uh, in New Haven or Miriam Alahi in Eastern or any, not just the community foundations, but the other, uh, whether they're family foundations or corporate foundations, uh, those issues aren't unique to our specific region. So to the extent that we do already share programs and ideas, our staffs are connected and, and talking on a regular basis. Uh, there have been ideas. In fact, the civic engagement, while we are uh, absolutely have our own activities and have had those activities for a number of years, uh, Mary Milahi out of Eastern, Community, Eastern Connecticut uh, is really championing uh, you know, a, a push to that civic engagement, and we are all in. So to the extent that, uh, you know, those discussions are ongoing and, and, and you know, we can help facilitate that discussion with, with the Fairfield community, I, I, I won't speak on behalf of Juanita, but I can tell you, you know, she is of the same mindset uh, in terms of how can we collaborate, where are there areas uh, that we, sometimes it's appropriate for us to uh, use our resources together, other times it's appropriate for us to, you know, be on the same page and then distribute the resources uh, through our respective uh, channels, but either way, uh, by all means, we would welcome that, uh, that conversation uh, and find those areas that we can collaborate and be victorious on. Uh, sometimes it's about finances, sometimes it's about convening, other times it's about the resource, uh, the capacity building that we have. So, uh, you know, don't hesitate in any way, shape, or form. Even if you aren't uh, in uh, one of our counties, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and have a conversation with us because of the relationships we have across the state. Uh, and we just never know, so we, we would welcome that. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I actually live in town, uh, and I'm much like Yvette, uh, Miss Yvette here. I do so much in Hartford. Uh, so I've been in town for eight years, my husband over 24 years. Uh, I would say over the eight years, I haven't been in any home. So the gentleman who made that comment, uh, when I walk up and down the street, I get the eyes, I get the unwelcoming looks, I get the, what car is she driving? Did she mow her lawn? Did they do this? Did they do that? And so I just have to say, from that perspective, I want to just put some candor into the conversation about where we are um, and where we live. I grew up in Bridgeport, so I preferred the city. I made my husband buy our law practice uh, in Hartford, um, so we would pay taxes in Hartford uh, on the West End, so uh, West Side on Oxford Street. So then, if this didn't work out for me, I had a place to go into this beautiful historic home that I remodeled uh, with him. It was too many offices, but we can change that. Um, but I also started to begin to fall in love with the town once I had my daughter. My daughter is 16 months now. And so then I said, yes, a little late bloomer, do the math. We're doing eight years marriage, a new little bloomer. Um, so, but I also, seeing it through her eyes, we come down here and we walk the park and it's so interesting. She says hello to everyone. And then how many people will not give her eye contact or how many people will stop and speak. And so the town has given me hope because it's about 50-50. Um, in terms of, and I would say when I first got here, I probably would get 10% of eye contact and a hello, um, just based off of race, um, or maybe gender, or maybe my outfit they don't like, or whatever the case may be. Um, but I, 
I, and I engaged. You saw me when I got here. I said hello. I, I bullied into tables and introduced myself. Um, so I think it's a part of um, shifting our culture, shifting our mindset. You want diversity. You want people who are talented, competent, and can live here and afford to live here. And it's not some charity or I need to be empathetic for this person. People have the means and the resources to be in the spaces and to live where they where they choose to live. And I also think that with that blessing also comes, you know, how do we work together more? And how do, so 24 years, how do you connect with someone who's been on the street for 30? And what's the best way to do that? So I'm kind of going on in a tantrum. That's the personal Donna. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that better and own that space. And with my daughter, you definitely get into the school clicks um, where you're definitely more welcome but there's just so much more um, that I think that I can offer to Glastonbury but I also give it to Hartford so because I'm embraced there um, they ask uh, and I just think they respect diversity and talent and what people can bring to the table in terms of varying ideas so I think that once you have these listening sessions it's wonderful but you also have to be well open to what you're going to hear second thing I wanted to talk about was more of my um, work and that is what's happening in our high schools and with our young people. I work with uh, mainly adult learners from veterans uh, to uh, you know individuals who could be 65 thinking about going into the digital media space to uh, little ones with Daniel Tiger. So we run the gamut. Um, but the drug epidemic that's happening so quietly in our schools that a lot of people aren't paying attention to. Our kids are using um, vapors to do drugs that you don't even smell anymore. And they're doing it in class with like teachers don't even recognize it anymore. And I, I think we have to get at to some of the root issues of what is happening to our children that we are allowing this privilege. And I, I talked about the means and all of that, not to say I, we're all in this working hard and saving and counting our pennies, but I said it because there are people who think that way and then they may work so hard towards the means they forget to look back and say, what is happening with those resources that I may have and that privilege that I've given uh, to my child? And so I think we all just need to take a really close look at what's happening in our school when we're mentoring in the schools, uh, walk in the bathrooms, do a pop-up. I call it a swirl. So where you just walk down the hall and you, hey, how you doing? And you see a lot, the water fountain swirls. So if you have the time to do that, that could be a valuable resource to our school. And then see something, say something. Like start having honest conversations about what's happening. And then I think race relations. Um, it was about six years ago, I went to the Martin Luther King programming that you fund, and it was extremely eye-opening and welcoming, and I applauded this town for doing it. I was shocked that it was here, um, and I was like, whoa. And when I went, I didn't know what to expect, but it was just really amazing people who were there for the right reason um, and who were trying, owning what they needed to own, both white, black, Spanish, you know, owning where their, their bias, their privilege, where their point is, and then saying, how could we work together better? And that's what I'm a firm believer. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. But I also just think saying hello, being cordial, um, understanding that you're your, your vantage point may not be mine and respecting that um, I think is just really important. And then lastly, we work with um, manufacturing. So you bring up a really good point. And I just want to leave. We are doing a whole series on Connecticut Public. I work with Connecticut Public Media. And we're talking about how we can shift the mindsets of parents and guidance counselors and educators. So beyond just the, the field and vocation, et cetera, it's talking about that definition of success. And me as a parent, how am I validated in terms of what field my child may go in or not go in. And so we're taking a different spin in terms of our marketing, but we're really trying to also bring that into high schools and to career days um, with a partner from Electric Boat or UTC or Pratt & Whitney. So they can really see what goes into these fields. And it's a very important topic because if we don't retool, retrain, reimagine our workforce development here in, in the state of Connecticut, that pipeline just continues to grow. 
companies will leave, that workforce will be untrained for those jobs. And it's a problem that's now. It's not a problem that will happen in 10 years. And so I think that that's a very good topic and strategy to start thinking about um, in terms of the advanced manufacturing, um, allied health and um, biomedical. Um, so there's, there's like different high demand job areas and I think that's a really important one, so. I know it's all over the place, guys. I'm sorry. I never spoke in eight years, so here you go. <laughs> Out. <laughs> in a candid and a respectful way, uh, because ignoring them or, or sort of, you know, politely dancing around them and not bringing them up doesn't make it better. And you, for you to share that uh, with us here is something that we appreciate. Uh, and the progress that we're seeing in communities uh, across the greater Hartford region is notable and laudable and, and commendable. Uh, but I don't think any would argue that there is still work that needs to be done. And as we said earlier, communities are more than houses and lawns and you know, restaurants and great school districts. They're people, but the relationship uh, between and amongst the people in the community is really more of an indication of you know, the, the, you know, the, the, where the community is in terms of these issues. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. And from, you, you know, again, you talked about uh, the importance of working with uh, learner. You work specifically with adult learners and how that is, or primarily with adult learners, how, again, as we look at our strategic plan, we've got a component that really does address that and is working with, we're not a direct service provider. Uh, so, you know, what we can do is financial resources, uh, research convenings and, and relationships like that uh, but we very much see that as a, a, a critical part of the, of the larger spectrum. So thank you for sharing that. Jim. Thanks for coming, Jay. Sure. I was going to try and keep quiet, but a few people know that's not possible. Um, a couple things. Don't take it personally. If I walked down the street and there was 10 people that didn't know me, I'd be lucky to have them one of them say hi to me too. That's a New Englander thing, like Ira said. You know, we don't know our next door neighbors, we don't invite them in the house, so you gotta see somebody three or four times um, before they'll talk to you. Um, but Jay, I think the one thing that I have heard and we've talked about, but I hope we get a sense of identity. I saw an interesting thing today that only a third of Connecticut residents were from here, born here. Um, so I think maybe that accounts for some of our parochialism because people pick a house in a school district to move to and the world has stopped. Yet we have 15,000 employees that commute here and we have another 15,000 that leave here to go elsewhere. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to live and work in town, but uh, I would be in a lot of trouble if I couldn't go over the Putnam Bridge to Weathersfield right. or up Route 2 to Hartford. Um, or other places to get out of town and my drugs and supplies and my employees couldn't get here. So I hope that you and Andrew and the rest of the board can work a lot on an identity, the fact that um, Greater Hartford is what the 25th, 26th richest metropolitan area in the country, um, a plethora of community resources and cultural resources that I don't think we talk nearly enough about. I mean, I travel around the country, I've been a lot of places, um, most people would die and most people that come here think how wonderful it is and you only hear about the negativity about what we don't have. Yes, it's an expensive place. The real estate's expensive because it's between New York and Boston. Taxes are high compared to other places, but our poverty rate's not 25%. Um, our kids go to school and uh, you know the sun comes up in the east. So I hope we can think a little bit in terms of all the things that we do have here. Not that we don't have challenges, we need to deal right. with them, but I think there's ways to go forward instead of just complaining and looking to move to that, Palm Beach, a, Florida. That's a great, great point. And, and I've seen that. Uh, being a, a one of the, the, the transplants, uh, I've said that my family and I, we're new to the Hartford area, but we're not new to the greater Hartford experience. Uh, and coming from a place that is very similar uh, in many regards, uh, you know, the, 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 we can be our own harshest critic. And that's, that's good and bad, but, but sometimes that can be you know, such an impediment to do, to absolutely seeing the assets here, the richness of the culture here, the opportunities here, not negating the very real challenges that the state has from a structural financial standpoint, that some of our communities have uh, financially and other, other very real issues and challenges here. Uh, but it is essential that we, you know, don't allow that to uh, keep us from acting on 
uh, or aspiring to all those things that you talked about. And, and you know, have seen the best, and, and I won't say the best and the worst, I've only been here a year, but have seen, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I, uh, having, you know, been a mayor of a city similar to Hartford, uh, look at communities, I, I, I think, a little bit differently and, and, and sort of try to see the very real issues, but at the same time, I have the benefit of being new and say, boy, you know, as, I, as we get around the, the community and the things that you pointed out, uh, you know, so hopefully 10 years from now, I'm not, you know, some grisly old, you know, cynical person. Ah, you know? uh, but I think there, there is really that, that opportunity. And, and it, particularly as we in this area, uh, like so many other areas, um, you know, find that balance between retaining, you know, the, 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 the families we have here of varying ages, but at the same time being a place that can attract uh, whether it's, you know, families or, you know, who are growing uh, into having children, uh, whether it's young professionals who can be in a whole host of other places wanting them to choose here, whether it's those who are moving toward retirement, uh, you know, we're not going to keep them here if, if we've got to make the case on the weather, but we can keep them here for, you know, other eight months of the year or have them be here for those eight months of the year. So it is really, uh, you know, a, a part of how I think the role that we have, a small part of that as a community foundation uh, with other interested parties across, across the region. Thank you. I saw you hand up right next to you, Blue. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Nick. Um, I, run a clean, I run the Clean and Green Laundromat here in town. We opened about uh, four or five years ago. I also live in the West End on Beacon Street. It's a sweet spot. Um, <laughs> is this necessary? Yeah, yeah, okay. for, 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 yeah we like got to capture you on. Yeah, weird. Um, yeah so I, I, live in, right. I live in Hartford, and uh, I have a business in Glastonbury, so I'm in between these two places a whole lot. Um, and I love living in Hartford. I wish people's attitude about Hartford um, would kind of change and people would kind of venture in there and show a little bit more love to it. Um, that's one of the major things I see at my store every day is talking to people. Um, you know, you mentioned Hartford and it's immediately, oh, we're a shithole, oh, you know, terrible place. And it's like I'm constantly an ambassador for Hartford reversing that. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was kind of to your point, um, in, I've done a lot of traveling uh, in my 20s so far. Uh, in 2014, I hiked the Appalachian Trail from the bottom of Georgia up to Maine. And I have never been in another state where people like loathe the state they live in as much as people in Connecticut. <laughs> it's unique to Connecticut. I've never, I haven't seen it anywhere else really. It's like everybody you talk to is just trying to like escape somehow and they don't realize, like you said, how nice of a place it really is because a lot of the people that live here probably haven't left and gained perspective traveling and doing other things. Um, and I think that's a big thing for our state is to start having a better self-image and other good things will follow once we can kind of correct that and, you know, to your point, seeing each other on the street and saying hello and being kind and like simple things like that, which are easy to do, you know, we don't need to invest a million dollars. It's just like little simple, simple acts like that. Um, yeah, that was, that was kind of my point, so. Thank you, Nick. And by the Appalachian Trail, you mean the actual Appalachian Trail? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Other? Oh, Andrew, I'm sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm Andrew Worthington. I'm on the board of the foundation, but I wasn't born here. I was one of the 35%, but I did come here at a year and a half in 1964. Grew up in, I would use a couple of names people know, Apple Hill on Sidemo Road. Uh, people probably maybe don't remember that we have the 51st state in, the, in here in Glastonbury, Nayok, at the Grange Fair, you know, and doing some of those things. The first place I ever got lost when I was five years old was at the Grange Fair in South Glastonbury. We're at Nayok, and I always learned about Nayok. But I'm, you know, I'm a class of 81, Glastonbury High School, and I came back here. I went to school in Maine. I came back to, I was one of the kind of people that actually returned here as a young person, couldn't afford to live here, unfortunately. My wife and I moved to Manchester, and we made, when we started having our children, we made that decision not to come back to Glastonbury for the reason not for because it was unaffordable. I did not want my children to kind of grow up in a kind of the homogeneous world of, you know, assimilate to this white culture and everything else around that Glastonbury was built up when I was in, when I was in school. 
and and I want them to be in part of a, you know a different type of diverse culture in that. And, and for a lot of different reasons, but um, it was a good choice for us. But I will say that I come back here a lot, and I really enjoy coming back here. I eventually moved my mother out of the house that I had to, and it was she lived in the classic, you know, three-story colonial and washer and dryer down in the basement, and you know, 80-year-old up in the top. And so she's uh, she's back in Manchester with us. But I get the privilege of working at Hartford as well. So. I don't go. I love all aspects, and if I could sell my house in Manchester, I'd move to Hartford in a, in a nanosecond, but we got dogs and cats and various things. But the couple points that I really want to make, and, and I think some of the points that are really being brought out is about collaboration. I mean, I can't emphasize enough that I think that's one of our missions, and just as, as a society in general, and because it does, but collaboration means that you talk to each other. You actually communicate, and we look at our children, and you know, I look at my children, my two daughters are 20 and 22, and probably the best place, and that this is for any young mothers or fathers or anyone else here, carpool. Drive carpool. You learn so much in carpool because you hear things, you learn things, and, and you know when they go silent and they're texting each other in the back seat, that's some good stuff going on back there. You gotta figure it out. But you do learn these things, but the communication at our younger people is tough. You know, they just, they don't have that type of communication. And we as adults have to start it and have to show how to do that communication. How do we work with someone else? How do we work with a diverse population and move amongst our crowds? You know, and I would encourage, you know, you to learn pe things about each other just in this room. I would encourage each and every one of you, go back and do two things. Number one, go on the Hartford Foundation website and read the other listening tours. Read the transcripts. You got. You look at this. So it's like, how many video cameras and cameras here going on? There is. There's video of this. There's transcripts of what's going on. There's these things that are up there that are being displayed. Learn what the main themes are in these various towns. Manchester, East Hartford, your neighbors. You have talents here in Glastonbury. Manchester has talents. East Hartford has talents, and all the other cities and towns that we go to. Read some of these transcripts. But I also would encourage you to look at the schedule coming up. We're only halfway through how many now? Oh, no, we're 19 in. 19 in. <laughs> he knows. 19. He's got the check mark going on the side of the car. That's for sure. So 19 out of 29. Hartford's coming up. I think Hartford's nec uh, next month? September. So I would encourage you to go, go to another listening tour. Listen to what they're talking about, some of their issues. Reach out if you see someone or hear someone. Network with these people. Listen to what they're trying to, t to say. Because the themes that you're talking about here, you know, there is some underlying theme amongst all the communities. And it is, it, it's, a, it's a way that we're going to be able to move this community forward. You know, there's a reason why we're 29, you know, 28 towns in one city, is that this is a common theme. We may be doing these individual listening tours, but I would tell you the discussion at the board level is about all of these and what are those main themes. And that's how we're building a strategic plan, is listening to these themes and weaving them together and trying to plan out that next three years. And, and you know, if you don't believe that this is important work, it is a very important work. And the comment about reaching out to us even though you're not in our community, absolutely. We want to hear from everyone and anything because it's important. It really is. In this network that we have, we know we have to collaborate. We've got to lead by that example. And Jay has done an unbelievable job. There's your kudos there. You've done an unbelievable job in connecting to the other foundations in this region, in this, in this state. In this state, and I will say I am all in with you guys over here, it is a great state. It is a great, and I don't care what people say, you know, where can you go anywhere, go up to the mountains, down in the ocean, to the lake, you know, just get into a, you know, get into Bradley, you know, if you don't want to go to Bradley, go to Logan, you go to New York, you've got anywhere to go. Within two hours, you just go like this, and it is an unbelievable place to be. And we've got to start with that positivity, realize that we have a unique opportunity as a group and as a, as a, as a community to make a difference and, you know, and you know, keep on coming back. The town has changed for me, there's no question. You know, and my biggest concern is probably the drug situations that we have with our young children. You know, the one thing I did hear in carpool was about drugs at Smith School. You know, and that was to me was just like, how could this be? How could it be happening at that level? But it is. And, you know, privilege brings different things. And um, 
but if we can collectively use our privilege, use the things that we have and our talents and bring all the people together, it will make this town even better, make this community even better. But do look at the other listening tours. We hope you do come out or at least read what we have done in the past because they're, they're great stuff. Jay's done a wonderful job with he and his staff and um, it's glad to be here and kind of come back. Thank you, Andrew, appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Henry Link, I'm from Hartford also, but I'm a member, longtime member of Glastonbury Audubon, Connecticut Audubon. And uh, anyway, I just want to say what I wasn't planning to say anything, but Andrew prompted me. Uh, Andrew, I've known you for a while and I really appreciate your comments. Thank Any, you. Anyway, I just want to say I don't know how many people here still read the Hartford Current. Any idea how many people still read the Hartford Current? Uh, good, because. A while ago, maybe six months ago, they put a, a, a request for people to write in about things, what are good about Hartford and what are good about Connecticut. And uh, just recently, there was a, a comment, uh, at a op, like an op-ed that specifically addressed the issue of Connecticut. And he says, you know, why is everybody going down on Connecticut? As, as somebody mentioned here, he said, there's so many people negative about Connecticut. And the, when there's so many positive things, although one, one unfortunate thing is I think so many people are focused on taxes. You know, they don't look at the good things. They just complain about their pocketbook or the taxes. Even if they're wealthy, they complain about the taxes. And I think it's an overriding issue, and I think it's ridiculous. Uh, you have to pay for the services, and the people don't appreciate the services. Most times, a lot of these people don't even know what services to get because they're so behind the scenes. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, if you read the paper, there are a lot of people that have said positive things about the city and about the Hartford. Same thing with Hartford's finances. Uh, if it weren't for the almost bankruptcy of the city, I think it would be a very good city. I, I grew up in Hartford also, and uh, I've seen a change, but I think with the uh, downtown new apartments and everything, people moving in, I have friends that moved in from Glastonbury, downtown, I mean, some seniors to move into Hartford when they're empty nesters, and they enjoy it. And I met a couple, this was maybe 10 years ago, a, couple, a younger couple from Glastonbury who moved into Hartford. They said they wanted to go into Hartford schools because of diversity and also the, the courses that were offered. Anyway, uh, just try to think more positive about the city and the state. And, you, the more, if your attitude would help change things in general. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lake. I appreciate it. Uh, it's funny, uh, about a year ago when I was still interviewing for, I think I was doing interviewing or I had just been selected, uh, was still in Washington, D.C. coming in. So I came in for some orientation, uh, flew into Bradley uh, very easily, and uh, a gentleman picked me up in an Uber, so I called Uber, and, and his Uber happened to be a, a Mercedes Benz. So I'm like, hey, that's, that's typically not your typical Uber ride. So I'm, you know, hopped in the back of his Mercedes Benz and we strike up a, a conversation. He asked me, you know, what brings me here? And we start talking about the relocation. Uh, and I say all that because he uh, was, um, he worked in uh, architectural design, uh, but had just moved into one of the new apartments or lofts in downtown Hartford. And he was telling me that he lived in Glastonbury, was relocating. So he had this, you know, 5,000 plus square foot condominium or out in Glastonbury and it would, loved it, and he said it was a beautiful community, but he uh, was at a point in his life, and he's probably in his 50s, at a point in his life where him and his significant other were, uh, you know, moving down into, into Hartford. So to me, being brand new, I didn't fully appreciate where all the communities were, but it was just a story that, that, that I recalled when you said that. Here was an individual on my first sort of weeks here was talking about how he loved Glastonbury but was excited to be moving in, into downtown Hartford. I did ask him, I sort of, so he just he tools around and Uber and his Mercedes just for, because the way his schedule works, he has free time on his hands, so that's what he chose to do. He said he meets interesting people and he you know, likes getting through the community. So thank you for sharing. So we have time for one more question and absolutely it's. I swear. So I've lived in Glastonbury for 11 years and I don't look like Dr. Beckett. No one talks to me either when I walk down Main Street. I say hello to everybody and I get a cold shoulder. One way I've combated that is volunteering in this community. And you horrified me when you said your giving is going to require boards to have diverse board of directors. No, I said we have a board diversity policy okay. that we very much uh, are proud to have and that we also recognize that 
Some communities uh, are more homogeneous than others, so to that extent, we take that into account. So we aren't just homogeneous. I'm, I am on the Glastonbury Partners and Planting Board of Directors, and we aren't just not, we aren't just um, homogeneous, we are old. <laughs> I'm the youngest person there at 55. Everybody else is over 70 and has a tough time bending down to weed. <laughs> this town, I did my homework, Andrew. I read the other comments for the other towns and we need to check that box about, we don't have any volunteers in this town. You can't get, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just need, I don't need, I don't even need skills. I'll teach you how to dig a weed or how, somebody, anybody see me doing the daylilies this morning on the islands on the highway? I just show up with a pulse the, and be willing to help I'll me. take it. <laughs> but it isn't just the partners in planting. We don't need skilled labor. There's many, many, many other organizations in this town doing fine things that need somebody under the age of 70. Please. And I'm self-employed. I work five to seven days a week, as my friend will attest. But in my free time, I'm volunteering and I'm meeting people. Thank you. Well, let me thank you, uh, particularly because you kept a streak alive that I was concerned about. So this is our 19th town, and in every one of the other 18 towns, the need for volunteers has come up. So I was thinking, man, we're concluding, and we haven't had that. And this wasn't staged, ladies and gentlemen. So this was a, a dramatic rescue at the final hour. Uh, this need for, in fact, we've heard it so many times, and it's been such a universal theme uh, that about two community meetings ago, uh, much, or well, hopefully not, to much to the chagrin of my staff, that I committed us to a symposium around volunteerism uh, in the beginning, uh, first quarter of 2019, uh, and, and to try to figure out how we as a foundation with other partners uh, can bring some innovative thought and actions to uh, helping to bolster volunteerism uh, in all of our communities. So it has now been 19 discussions straight that we've heard that we need and have a desire and a critical need for volunteerism. And it is not easy, uh, because if it was easy, it would be done. People are uh, stretched and committed, uh, but love their communities, love their towns. So we are already talking to some of our other fellow community foundations about this uh, and figuring out what can we bring to this, I'm just calling it a symposium, I don't know what it would be, but a gathering in, in, in 2019 where all of our community will be invited to uh, hear from whether it's we need to bring in national experts, whether we, uh, you know, in addition to putting some resources to this to help address this issue that is, you know, uh, again, been universal in each of our communities. So I want to thank you for sharing your time. Yes, sir. Oh, I, well, I mean, you're, you got your hand up, but I, I can't, you know, end with you sort of. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to say a couple words, maybe about volunteering. Okay. Um, I think we have quite a few volunteers, and we'd love to have more. Good. Because I've been a volunteer for a long time. I'm with the Historical Society. I'm, the, I'm on their board. Uh, talk about volunteering. I've been chair of their facility committee now for 43 years. And that starts God bless with, you. That starts with the moving of the house in the center of town, the big yellow house right in the center of town. Everybody thinks it belongs to the Chamber of Commerce. Well, it belongs to the Historical Society. We run it to them. It's one of the ways that uh, we get our money to run the society because we get no help from the town. Everybody thinks the town is a, uh, the Historical Society is a town function, but we're not. The one thing I'd like to add to that, I was the president when that house was moved. And my name was on the loan for the length of the, t of the, of the time that before we paid for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping she's with you. I'm hoping you, you, you know, you know, I, I, know I, I know that. I'm just giving you. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one that happens to when I stand up and talk. Okay, we're kindred spirits. But what I wanted to say was that the Harper Foundation has been, I would say, very good to us. Uh, my job as a facility chair was to preserve buildings. Well, let me go back a second and tell you. The goal of the Historic Society, our objective, is to maintain our history that we have in town and to educate people on our history. And that's what we're trying to do. We preserve buildings. And what I was going to say, the Harvard Foundation has been good to us because uh, 
you provided the resources for us to move a lot of buildings. The last building we moved was the uh, big tobacco shed downtown, which gives us space for a lot of our horse-drawn buggies and so forth. And what I wanted to say to a lot of the people is we'd love to have you come down and either volunteer or come down and see what we have there and what our history is, because that is our job. And we're, I think the uh, foundation can also help us other than dollars, is integrating with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of programs. Every fourth grader in our school system goes through our property. Mm -hmm. uh, several of them, the museum, we have a museum which maintains uh, the history of a lot of businesses and so forth. We have the house in South Glastonbury, which uh, has a great number of barns on it and so forth. And we have the kids come down there. And uh, some people in town have provided us clothing and the kids get dressed up and they go do the activities that children used to do in the early days and they find out that wasn't so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of work. Uh, in that area, I think uh, the, the foundation could help us some with uh, maybe dollars, maybe coordinating with other people because we have brought in other people now, uh, other schools to go there and we could use help on running the organizations as far as people. We have a couple of teachers that have come in and they're excellent on running the organization. So if somebody wants to come down and see history, we have it. We'd be glad to show it to you. Thank you. We'd be glad to have you volunteer. Thank also. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll, 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 I've got a seven-year-old I'll send down so you can show him what life was like before Wi-Fi. It, it's, <laughs> It's not a crisis because the Wi-Fi isn't fast enough. I mean, there was life before Wi-Fi. Again, thank you for, for your sharing those comments. Thank you all for affording us uh, some of your time. I know you're busy, you've got jobs, families, other obligations, but the fact that you've spent this evening with us is not something we take for granted. This is helping us to formulate and put in place our next strategic plan. Uh, this is helping us to guide our grants and our investments, and you are all going to be invited to our Celebration of Giving, which is November 15th, uh, and you, you, you will, you're going to demonstrate there what we've heard uh, and how it is really shaping our actions and, and talk about some exciting things specific to each of our 29 communities. T specific, we'll talk about the region, but also talk about some of the things specific to each of the 29 communities. So thank you all. Uh, we appreciate your uh, relationship with the foundation, your generosity, your work in the community, and we look forward to an ongoing conversation. Thanks for joining us this evening. <laughs>